Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bill Jordan here with Art with Bill. I'm your host, Bill Jordan. And whether you're a producer, whether you are a maker, or whatever, of art, this is shows for you. We believe that people who know people buy from them. That's why we want to tell your story. And today's no exception. We have a fantastic story, and you'll see how it pans out in a minute. From a gentleman all the way from Tucson, Arizona, by the way of Southside Chicago. Good morning, Paul. Paul Hotman, how are you doing today? Great. Great, great. And, and Paul, uh, before we get started, how was your commute in to work today? <laughs> well, the good news is <clears throat> it's going to be 80 degrees here in Tucson, and oh. uh, I work from home. I have a studio. Okay. So, so, so you had a, like a, a five-second walk into work? Yeah, it was, um, you make a cup of coffee and you walk down the hall and you open up the door and you, I'm working live. <laughs> all right, all right. So, so now, you're in, how long have you been in Tucson, by the way? Well, visiting for about 35 years and uh, for the last uh, little over seven years, we've uh, had homes here in Tucson. And, and so where, where were you living before? Well, mostly, I grew up in a little uh, town called Blue Island, which is just south of Chicago. And actually, the railroad first came to Blue Island, and then they had this suburb called Chicago. And <laughs> the rest is history, as you can see now. Well, that's, I, believe it's, uh, I believe it's snowing in Chicago today. Yeah, there's a, little, a few flurries here as well in New Jersey. You know, but I know that you get a lot of snow in Chicago, but... Uh, Chicago, now tell us, I know you have some fantastic stories about Chicago. Can you give us one or two of those? Well, I, wow, um, I could talk about snow, I could talk about uh, most anything. I guess um, one of my favorite pastimes was really as living in, as a youth. Um, when we first got a black and white TV. I think I was about six years old. And yeah. back in the early 50s, um, what it was like for me was I was infatuated with TV. Um, and the whole culture was, uh, in my world, was cowboys. So there were all kinds of stations that went into uh, the 50s through the 60s and even into the early 70s. We watched programs on TV, uh, particularly Sunday night. It was, it was uh, animal programs like Lassie, Wild Kingdom. But my favorites really were the Westerns, watching Hopalong Cassidy. Hopalong uh, Cassidy. Now, who, who, Hopalong Cassidy, for those who don't know, was my childhood idol as well. And so it, it's, it, is that how you got involved in the kind of work you do now? By the way, what kind of work do you do, your artwork? How would you just define your artwork, Paul? Well, it's um, scratch board. So uh, what I do is I practice the fine art of scratch board. I, I work with collectors of wildlife art who want to experience an ongoing connection with nature. And I do this on a, a daily basis. So scratch board, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's the oldest art in the world. Really? How, how, how is that? Explain that to me. How did it come about? Great. The, uh, do you know what a petroglyph is? Yes, yes. Okay, so a cave woman, cave man, took a hard stone and created a divot in a soft stone. And oh, then right. took the minerals out of the soil and pushed it back into the, the rock. So... In essence, that's called scratch a rock. I now the uh, now how it's uh, at present day. I mean, you you can go all over the world and you see lots of petroglyphs. Today, scratch board is a, is a representation of that. So it starts with a piece of masonite on the bottom. There's ink on top, and then in the middle, like an Oreo cookie, it's white soft clay. So I literally take a needle and scratch. I scratch the board. I do two things. I'm taking off the ink. 
I am then also creating a divot, a very small divot in the clay. Oh, okay. So I can A, leave it black and white, or B, I can take then different mediums of color like pastel chalk. I can use uh, transparent ink. I use sometimes magic marker, depending upon the illustration or the effect I want to, I want to the, uh, the end result will, will be. And I push that into the crevices. So that's scratch board. So between scratch rock and scratch board, that's how it started. Oh. And, and, <laughs> and that's what I do today. Well, how, how did you get into that? How, did someone show you that? You discovered it? How did that happen? Well, it, it really started with my dad. We had a 15 second conversation. He wanted higher education for me <clears throat> beyond high school. So I really wanted to grow up and just be like my dad and work. Okay. And so he gave me a choice, um, college, art school. I chose art school. So wow, okay. American Academy of Art in Chicago. Yes. Um, the first course, you it's mandatory, it's called Fundamentals. So it was a nine month course. Every 30 days you had a different medium. Um, so I started with buying charcoal and then it would start to go through all the different um, ways of creating art with all the different supplies, et cetera. And the seventh month, I had 20 days training in Scratchboard. Wow. And I, and I hit. It's, I found my medium. I got an A. Okay. So that, for me, a, an A was a big deal. Yeah, it, is a, it still is a big deal. It still is a big deal. So, and, you know, it's now 47, 48 years later, and I continue to work on Scratchboard. I took a number of years off um, because as an artist, uh, 19 years old, uh, I needed to eat. So yes. I, I got involved with the, um, I spent 40 years in printing. Oh. So I got to reproduce art and find out all the way from the uh, pre-press and all the things that make it up to actually doing illustrations to then sales and I called on agencies and I would um, take people's art and transform them all the way to a printed project in a box delivered on their doorstep. So, so you, were, you were honing your, your business skills while you were working at the printing agency. Absolutely. So let's go back for a second. Now, your dad told you you had a choice, college or art school. You went to art school. You did well there. Yep. What, did, what did he say? How did he feel about that? You know, I, I had the privilege to have a uh, terrific father that just allowed me choices. He realized that, you know, at 18 years old, um, he was pretty much, I developed my personality. Um, I showed prowess um, working since I was uh, probably 13 years old and different job. you know, started off with newspaper routes. And I worked in a bakery. I worked in a bakery for five years. So I would get up at three in the morning. I'd run to work, which is about a mile away. Uh -huh. I'd work from four to eight prior to school. Really? Yep. And that's how I paid for art school. So I, okay. I right. took the initiative to, you know, I'm the oldest of 12. Yes. So, wow. 12 kids in your family? Whoa. So the whole, the whole idea was I kept looking over my shoulder at my dad is like, how is he going to afford? Well, first of all, trying to feed that amount of kids. Right. You know, I'm, it's, it's 10 boys and two girls and the boys can eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And yep. that, you know, like, here's something I want to ask you. I mean, I look at your pictures, your photographs. I mean, you appear to be about 6'6 six, six or something like that. Um, I'm 6'3". I'm, I'm just average height from my family. All for your family. Okay, all right. Well, you know, I, I thought you wouldn't, you wouldn't fire in the rock in the basketball court. You know, when it came to sports, I was more interested in working and gaining monies for futures. It, you know, sports wasn't my thing. Um, my mother didn't allow me to go out for football. She just saw it as violent and uh, wasn't interested. So I worked and I enjoyed it. You know, I, I really, you know, my father was my idol. Yes. And he, you know, to put food on the table, he had a number of jobs. And he was good at just about everything he touched. 
So what, 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 what kind of work, what kind of jobs did he do? Well, out of the Navy in World War II, uh, he worked for Illinois Bell for 44 years. Oh, okay. And as a uh, lineman, cable splicer, uh, outdoors, he was a large, he was larger than I am. Wow. Uh, and of course, did about most anything. He could fix, you know, he would own apartment buildings and uh, he, was, he was one busy guy. So right. I, my hero, my dad. Right, I, I, I see where you get your business acumen from. So that's how I started doing this. And then on my, I developed into, with, with some printing knowledge, um, I don't own the equipment to make all of my reproductions. Yeah. I, I, I have originals that um, are available. I also sell reproduction prints. So how I do that is I, a, I go to local shows, and then I start traveling. I travel the Southwest. Um, on average, I go in between 22 and 35 shows per year. Wow. And I have a dedicated vehicle. I put all my artwork in, all my tent, my display. Mostly I do outdoor shows, and I, you know, I go throughout the Southwest. Colorado is one of my favorites. Uh, my, one of my daughters, three, we have... Um, we have three daughters, grown, married, oh. so one of them's in Denver, so I frequent the Colorado. Right. Uh, I go to Utah, California, New Mexico, Kansas, et cetera, and um, I demonstrate live the entire time. So it's, oh, okay, so you're, you're, you're working at, at, the, at your, your expos. Yes, and I get to see the beauty of the Southwest. Yeah, and driving. I just see incredible, you know, wild animals. I, you know, um, I've seen a hundred pronghorns as I passed at about seventy miles an hour, wow. and they're all looking at me. And I know if I hit the brakes, they're gone. <laughs> so, so let, before we get too deep into that, let's go back to the early days when you're watching black and white TV. Yes. Now, who who was who was your your main character? Well, you know, it, it's funny you should ask because. I think I was five or six years old, and um, one of my prized possessions was uh, one Christmas, I got Hopalong Cassidy pajamas. And there he is. There's Hoppy. <laughs> right there. And there he is. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. So, so now, for every, everybody listening out there, Paul has a special offer today. And this, the offer is this if you can name Hoppy's sidekick or the name of his horse, you get a free Hopalon Cassidy screensaver. Isn't that right, Paul? Absolutely. All right. So that's Hopalon Cassidy, and, and this is the inspiration, one of his inspirations to, to do Southwest art. Let's move right along to one of his major images here. Here's, here's the first sample of Paul's work. Tell us about this work, Paul. Well, this is Lily. So, um, Sometimes I take pictures, I go to ranches, um, people's homes, I'll, I'll do. <clears throat> what I do is domestic, free range and endangered species. So, and I have a tendency, um, probably the most popular item that's requested and then I do is horses. Okay. So this happens to be the name of a uh, horse is Lily, uh, Marcia, is the owner she has two uh horses and uh i was intrigued by the photograph of the long eyelashes yes the, the breed is called a halflinger and it's a yeah. cross between a belgian workhorse and and a uh, uh oh a, a Belgian, um, Is it like those those uh, but uh, Anheuser Bud horses? Those no, drafts? no. I, you know what? I just lost it. So That's I'll come right. To, move right along. Yep. Yeah. So um, and she has two of them, and they're extremely an Arabian. Holy smokes! I found it. So um, 
it's got the spirit of an Arabian, but they're smaller, uh, medium-sized horses, more round, extremely friendly. Oh. Okay. And what was intriguing about this one is I've done lots of illustrations of horses, but I've never seen eyelashes like that. Oh, okay. Is, is, that, so, is that particular to, to this particular uh, specimen, this breed? No, to, to the particular breed, that's correct. Ah. And this is her summer coat, so she's blonde and kind of a, um, uh, just almost a, a very slight butternut um, color. And then in the winter, she turns more gray and then our uh, oh, wow. yellow, yellow blonde. So, you know, summer coat and winter coat. And, yes, uh, right, right. Summer coat and winter, winter, winter. Oftentimes I get, um, I'm on social media. Yes. So I see through either a professional or um, an amateur photographer um, an image. And I contact the people, I, um, introduce myself, scratchboard artist. And uh, I, 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 I compliment them on the photo. I ask them, would it be possible to use this for one of my subjects in Scratchboard? And for, for that privilege, in other words, the copyright um, privilege. Yes. So what I offer is I'll give them the first signed edition print, framed. Oh, wow. And then, and then on the certificate of authenticity, which is on the back of my work, I credit them as a photographer. So it's a win. The whole idea is win wins. So let, 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 let's You're, jump into that. I just want to create more win wins in life. And this is one that really works for most people. Yes, I see that. Let's talk about your framing. You, you, you're some type of innovator in, in the framing industry with respect to your, to your scratch board work. Is that right? Well, um, yeah, for the last four years, I really enjoy it. So framing is a whole subject in itself. It's amazing. You know, frame, a poor frame, um, people walk by the illustration and don't give it much thought. If it's framed appropriate for the image, for the room, for the, uh, the style of home you have, um, for the region you live in, um, it's it's really, it's a complete package. It would be, so I frame art, I wrap my art in more art. So it would be just like uh, your wife goes out for the evening. She, you know, puts her hair up the way she wants it. She dresses herself in a, uh, in a nice outfit. She puts on jewelry and it's a nice, the whole idea is it's a nice package. So what I do specifically is I harvest mesquite, ironwood, uh, and different hardwoods from the desert, uh, from the Southwest. And I work with a couple different woodworkers, um, retired woodworkers or cabinet makers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And they take, run them through a sawmill and create a frame. Oh, okay. Uh, that's all handmade. And I use, um, then what I do is I take it back to my shop, which I have a, a shop where I, I do all the uh, woodworking. I start sanding and then I inlay turquoise and chrysocolla. What's chrysocolla? What's that? So chrysocolla, actually it was Cleopatra stone. Oh, okay. So it's, it's a copper-based mineral hmm. and it comes in blues and greens, et cetera. Wow. And many different other minerals in it but okay. it, it's a um it's fairly common here in the southwest so turquoise is extremely expensive and i have some of that depending upon the request that i get uh, you know, it comes in blues and greens and different different colors and how i gather all these stones is a, a i go to abandoned mines and you have to be careful about that i go to the gem show which is in tucson which is the largest show here in the world. So it's right in my backyard. I'm pretty excited about that. Yes. Um, and then if I'm out in the desert, um, occasionally I'll find different stones. The advantage of chrysocolla and turquoise is it's soft enough where I can take it, crush it into 
um, very, very small pieces all the way down into powder. And then I use different epoxies and glues, et cetera, to embed that permanently within the frame. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yep. so here's a question for you. Yeah. Take us through your average day. I mean, what time do you get up? What do you do? Do you, do you have to walk? <laughs> My average day is, um, I guess it's training from the bakery. I get up about 530, sometimes five, sometimes earlier. Um, today was 530. So um, I would check my emails. I'd go through the process. I've already uh, outlined my day. Some, uh, most mornings I'll go off to different suppliers either to pick up prints, frames. Um, I'll come back. I'll work in the shop for a little while, um, creating the frames or household chores. Um, and then I have a tendency to want to go into from 10 to about 2. I have a tendency to want to go into the studio. I still have great light coming in in the right. morning. Um, and I work on my illustrations. You know, some of them, you know, I could do, some may take me an hour if I do a real long, uh, a very um, short piece or a small piece. Yes. And then I can go into, as the um, examples come up, I can speak to what's the longest piece, how do I do it, what tools do I make? I mean, that's, we can go on and on about all that subjects. Um, so so you, you work from between what, 11 and, and two, you do your, your artwork, and then in the afternoon, what do you do? When, when do you have lunch, when do you have dinner? Well, I take breaks because uh, working with Scratchboard, um, what I need is my eyes and hands, and I'm blessed. Um, uh, so every about 10, 15 minutes, I need a break because I'm tall. I bend over my easel. Um, so I have to do stretching. Um, and so I stretch before I, I work on a scratch board. I go up, get a cup of coffee. Uh, I take a break uh, because uh, the strain on your eyes and also uh, muscles because I'm using a hand motion. Yes. Um, so I often take breaks. I I can I can work for as much as three four hours, but they are systematically um, scattered in with breaks. So you do have some type of uh, uh, okay, workout regimen or something? You do a lift weights? You run? Do you? What do you do? Um, weights? Really, to take in, um, I do hand exercises, um, etc. To get flexibility into. You know, it avoids um, or helps minimize arthritis and any tension in hands. Right. But absolutely, um, you know, I have to loosen my body up because I then go into more or less a very confined area working with a needle, you know, and right. might do minuscule, I might do dots, I might do scratches. Um, in the case of this illustration with Lily here, you could see all the long hairs. Um, I would go in with an exacto knife, the back of an exacto knife, as a matter of fact, and go in and create the long ones. How long did um, it take you to do this one? Uh, about a hundred hours. Wow, man! You know, if you can, if you can go in and see the um, the eye itself, there's it was done with nothing but dots. So I used five different instruments, five different gauges of needles or instruments to do this illustration. Wow. All of my tool, it's very simple. All my tools fit in this, a small shoebox. <laughs> you, you, have, you have no brushes, huh? Um, I have minimal brushes. Um, you know, they're very, very fine, and, you know, I, I use them occasionally. Um, mostly it's just scratching. How, and this, how'd you, how'd you get the three to one million four? <laughs> How'd you get the, the, the tone variance? How'd you get the whites and the browns? How'd you get that? What do you, how do you do that? Well, after I'm done black and white, then uh, as I spoke before, I can use three different mediums of magic marker, which in this case does not work. Uh, I'll use ink, transparent ink. Um, and this was all done with pastel chalk. So it's a dry method. So really? what I'll do is I'll lay down a tone. Um, I'll spray it lightly with a workable fixative, and then I'll come back with a second layer of chalk, 
spray it, come back with a third one. And I could be plus and minusing the amount of pastel colors um, accordingly until, I'm, until it's resolved. So the whole board started black. Everything else is removed. Okay. Yep. I know you mentioned that before, that the, the blackness has something to do with the image. Yes. Well, here's a sidebar question for you. And I'll make a crude analogy. Since you're from Chicago, I'll use a Chicago analogy. <laughs> you know, we have a guy named Michael Jordan. Yes. And Michael Jordan was a great basketball player. Phenomenal. The yeah. Best. Yes. Yeah, I think so. But he, he had a coach, right? Coach. Yes. But he had coach Phil to keep him on his game to make him better. Yes. Who's Paul Hoffman's coach? Great question. So in the world of Scratchboard, there's an international organization. And it's just, you know, to, to go online and find it, it's very simple. It's scratchboardsociety.com. Okay. In the world of Scratchboard, there are 14 masters in the world. So originally started uh, only five years ago. Uh, I'm getting mentored by three different masters. Wow. And you said 14 or 40? 14. 14 in the world. Wow. Okay. So Scratchboard Society, is a, it's, there, there are a number of Scratchboard. I mean, it, 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 was, extre it was very popular back in um, the 50s and 60s to have this in an art, an art school, excuse me, in an art program in yes. school. So what I do is I communicate with these people and other Scratchboard. In the Scratchboard Society, it's a growing organization. Uh, there's about 200 of us worldwide. There are many other people that do Scratchboard that uh, do not belong to the society, but the society is growing. Uh, and what do, they, what do your coaches, how do they help you? What, what do they say? Well, most of the communication is all done online. After I'm done with the Scratchboard, or if I have a question, I can go on the internet and ask them accordingly. I may send them an image and get coaching. Um, I, I would say Heather Laura is a Scratchboard master in California. I drove to California. Okay. And I was in an inquiry because I had only used uh, transparent ink just a few times in a very small area. Heather Laura does illustrations 24 by 36. Wow, man. In other words, and she'll spend three, four, five hundred hours on an illustration. Mm. So in, in the world of Scratchboard, Heather, she's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I went and I spent about an hour and a half with her and uh, I created, uh, she helped coach me on a bison, uh, the bison illustration. Is that, uh, is that the one we have in the queue? Yes, sir. You want to go to that one now? Absolutely. I'd love to talk about it. Okay. There you go. Okay. So the, it was, the largest board I've ever done, 2436. Okay. I had illustrated it and scratched it all black and white and was in an inquiry about how to use ink at this particular scale. So what, what I got from Laura, from Heather, um, was that I could take, do it all black and white and then ink it all color at all. And then she showed me how to re-scratch it black and white and ink it, re-scratch it black and white, ink oh, it, re-scratch it black. Okay. So I did that process. And what, what it does is I'm now removing a lot of the black ink. Yes. And putting, uh, and now I'm putting ink where the white clay is showing. So what I'm doing is I'm creating an under fur. Oh, wow. So what, I did this about seven, eight times. Um, 
in specific areas. And overall, I did it six times. And then I seven, eight, I went back in again and again. So I would re-scratch it, re-ink it, re-scratch it, re-ink it. So this process took 250 hours. 250 hours. And that's the right. So it took me about about three months to complete. Yes. Um, and I, in the meantime, I was working on smaller works where I could <clears throat> give it some time in between inkings, and then I would gain a new perspective. And then when I went back to do the illustration, I had a good starting point. I realized yeah. what was next. It's like, okay, because if you work on it systematically over a long period of time, you get jaded. So I have to walk away from the art, leave it be, and then come back. And it's, and then all of a sudden it's obvious what, to me, what's next. So, so, so Paul, it's, this is a wonderful piece. I, I love yeah. it. Uh, well, it, it was the first one that I got voted in as Paul, this is master work. Yes, no doubt. Okay. Is, is this, this piece is for sale? Sold. All American. Congratulations. Yeah, it was, it was um, Yes, it was put in a uh, a private event and um, here in Tucson. Uh, okay. Very, pr very uh, proud to uh, be a part of uh, the exhibition. It was in an exhibition with 316 artists, 430 pieces. Wow. It, it took best to show. Oh, can, oh, go ahead. You modest, you modest. Go ahead, man. <laughs> So, well, it's, it's a real, you know, and um, it broke my heart to sell it because. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's made and, right. So anyway, now, yep. did, did, so, so this is the first, first one. And right now, to be a master, um, here, here's a good, con here's a fun conversation. To be a master, um, you need 10 pieces to be voted in by three masters. Okay. So, judge and jury. And it's not only that, then they want to know who you are in the world for promoting Scratchboard. Are you published? Yes. Uh, what, national, um, what national magazines are you in? What museums are you in? How many awards have you won? What prestigious galleries are you in? In other words, it's all encompassing. It's not just, I was explained, it's not just the work. So um, I'm working on it. Yeah, I see. I think you have also, let's go, here you have, this is your book you, you, you've written, right? Yes. Can you tell us about the book? Sure. So as I go to these uh, different shows, people ask, uh, Paul, they give lessons. You know, I'll be in Denver. And I say, sure, you need to fly to Tucson. And of course, that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, <clears throat> what I did was create, the first book of Scratchboard, and, and how and why I titled it was, um, it's simple. I've, I've given art lessons, um, been involved with different uh, non-for-profits, etc., and always been interested in art. I watched my our, our three girls, three daughters, grow up, and I found that the high creative stage is about 11 to 14. Okay. Now, uh, that's the concentrated stage because... Um, they're just high creative. And before all the noise starts in with all the hair and the makeup and all of that stuff, this was now going back a few years ago and now it's earlier, but high creative stage. So what I did was I went into a photographic studio and I did a illustration of a small bear. Okay. All those slides and convert them to a 20 page book. Oh. And it's the first book of Scratchboard. It tells you exactly how I do, do, do this work. And I offer it online or at my booth. And it comes with four Scratchboards. It's a book, a tool, um, and um, so not only are people purchasing it for, you know, gifts, holidays, uh, birthdays, et cetera, for youth, but seniors are buying it because they have the time. Yes. And, and rather than taking on <clears throat> other artwork forms, you know, you can go, always go to a watercolor class or an oil, but 
Here, it's tabletop. You can do it at your kitchen table. Exactly. So it's, it's a minimal term investment. And it, all it is is hand-eye. Hand-eye, hand-eye, hand-eye. It's exercises in hand-eye. Hand-eye exercise you use every day. You use it on a computer. So, so, Paul, let me ask you this. Hand-eye, hand-eye. A lot of people in the uh, baby boomers, yes. they're, they're facing that thing called, what's it called? You can't remember. It's called Alzheimer's, right? Yes. It, this, I, it would, I mean, I'm thinking, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but this will help sort of like stay that off or, you know, it, you know, keep it from coming so soon. What do you think about that? Well, great question. Um, yes. So part of my teaching is I'm going into retirement homes. Okay. Uh, lived in Florida for two years. You know, I call them silos because they're literally <laughs> floor after floor after floor. And I would go in um, and give art lessons just with a pencil and paper. Yes. And, it, it was amazing. Um, most are women, um, and majority had arthritis. You know, I mean, carpal tunnel syndrome, etc. Um, and it really—it's so inspiring. It was. It still. The, my experience is it brought tears to my eyes, and I—I I, I start. Well, tell, tell us now. Come on, start, start that because I literally. They would, one exercise I had, yes. you know, hand eye, and I would take them through different exercises. And <clears throat> they'd take a pencil and a paper and then some magic markers if they chose color. And I would go through exercises like when you were five years old or six years old. Yeah, right. What was your favorite toy? And they would draw it. And these women in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, would turn into five-year-old little girls. Wow. And so I, I have to tell you, it was so moving to see that. They were, they, I had all the uh, pieces on a small card table and they would walk around and all they would do is giggle and compliment each other <laughs> and then talk about their first toy that was memorable when they were five and six years old. And what they did was they drew better than they ever thought before because it was in their mind. It already was established and they had, they could picture it and they thought about that for years and years and years. And all we did was bring up a memory. Yeah, right. So that really was the start uh, of my trying to go beyond my daughters with art lessons. You know, Saturday mornings, it was easy. Uh, I had a cup of coffee and we would do a half an hour of art lessons before the cartoons or before jobs. So really? I did that just on a family basis. Now uh -huh. I'm taking it. Uh, I was looking for something to do down in Florida. We lived there for about two years. I wanted to become involved and do, give something back to the community. So now here I'm in Tucson and um, Friends of Western Art funds 38 schools with art supplies. So okay. I know okay. I'm going Wait, to, Paul, tell us about that. Well, who are the Friends of Western Art? What do they do and why are you involved? Um, well, Friends of Western Art is, is literally, it's a non-for-profit. And um, here in Tucson, they, they do a couple of things. It's, um, there's about, I think about 150 members. And every month for nine months, because the summer they, um, they don't, people go back to maybe a secondary home or go off to the coolness of the mountains or uh, etc. because it's a little warmer for some people here in Tucson. I live here year round and it doesn't and I've learned to adjust to it. And what um, it's 80 degrees there today you said? Yes. <laughs> oh poor baby, poor baby. Yeah well it's gonna it's gonna drop down this weekend to uh, the high will be 52. So Ooh, that's, 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 that's a serious drop 30 degrees. It's, it's brutal. Yeah. So from the back of Western Art what they do is they they put on once a month a seminar um, and they bring in 
a silversmith. They'll bring in a potter. They'll bring in a painter. They'll bring in the last uh, time where they brought in lawyers and appraisers on how to appraise art and then the financial responsibility. Um, we find here in Arizona that some people have um, tremendous large collections of art and their kids don't want it. It's not their style. So they're now looking at dispersing their collection to museums. How do you do that? What's the value? And now it starts to become more involved with um, the finances and then there's a lawyer involved. Yes. Uh, because, and sometimes it goes to the estate. Well, how do you disperse that? So Friends of Western Art is an all-encompassing education and entertainment in the fact of working, people bring in their works and then work live and explain their medium in detail. So part of their non-for-profit is they've decided to support artworks as long as you do Western art. So again, in the, in the school system here, there's no art in fourth grade. So I'm back to teaching only this is a more systematic because I'm teaching larger classes, which is a hoot. Yes. I go into a fourth grade or a fifth grade and I turned into a fourth grader. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start laughing and telling jokes and et cetera. And I've, I've actually, um, they've funded a video and I have a video of that experience. It okay. will soon be posted on friendsofwesternart.org. How did you, how did you get involved with the Friends of Western Art? Well, there's an organization called the Mountain Oyster Club, which is about 60 years old, and it's one of the largest collection of cowboy art in the Southwest, and probably in the United States. Again, it's um, the average, and they open it up for the public one day a year in, in the third week in November. So they encourage um, people to submit their artworks, and you can go to mountainoysterclub.com and learn more about it. Okay. Let's, let's go back to some of the other works. You have some good stuff. We, let's talk about this one. So this is, the title is called My Girl. Yes. And uh, this little girl, Jennifer, is a photographer. That's mom. And she's on her knee with a telephoto lens. Her daughter is five years old. She's looking right at mom, and so is the sheep. Wow. This started back in the early 80s with a rodeo queen who decided um, one way to get youth involved with rodeo was to mutton bust. So what they do, the, the criteria is you have to be in between five and seven. Yes. And weigh no more than 50 pounds. Okay. And in the rodeo as in um hanging bronco buster or bull riding the limit there is you have to be on the animal for eight seconds the bell yeah. goes off and now you can exit one way or the other okay in mutton busting it's six seconds okay well she won <laughs> she won the gold buckle she wow. hung on for six seconds and this is her best pose so i you know, I go to I go to rodeos. I go to um, different different shows. I wind up at ranches. Um, I'll actually be going to the Dude Ranchers Association, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. So, so Paul, it sounds like you, you like everybody knows you down there because of your work and your social commitment. So how does that how's that working out for you? Great. You know, I can't get enough. You know, <laughs> if I go back to Hopalong Cassidy. I guess <laughs> I, I think I think about geez what what would happen if I would just ride it directly to Tucson? <laughs> <laughs> and I've been I've been visiting through my um, my wife's parents uh, have been here for thirty five years, so we've been coming here since the eighties. Okay, and, and it's just you know seeing the growth of Tucson that was just voted uh, the best town for restaurants. Um, it's getting busier, there's high growth, but I only live one, 
one block from thousands of acres of desert. And I have wildlife running through my property let's, all the time. Let's talk about that because we want to talk about these these guys. The, the let's here's the family of horses, and you know it, it's kind of a downer from our uplifting conversation. But share with us what's happening with with the horses. Great. Okay, Mark Terrell was a photographer I met in a show in Las Vegas. Um, and he runs the roads in Nevada. So in this particular, to be specific about this illustration, <clears throat> he jumps out of his truck, has his telephoto lens. Here is a band, what they refer to a band of Mustangs. These are free range Mustangs running wild in Nevada. And what's interesting about this group is you can see the mare in the middle, she's still nursing the colt. You see how round she is at the, at the bottom. Right, right, right. The one right behind her is her, her, <clears throat> her um, previous generation, and then Papa is in the background, the yeah. dark one, right? Right, right? When Mark went up with the camera, they gathered tighter, they looked at him, and then the yearling put his head right over <laughs> mom's back. Wow, man. So in, in essence, the title of the illustration, All the Family. Yes. I, just, I mean, this is National Geographic. Yes. And I'm, you know, traveling to different shows and different ranches, et cetera. Um, due to this and a few other shots, I've really created moments in Western life created a small logo, and I had that um, on some of my photograph, the photographs of the illustrations. How, does, how, do, how do the real, the real Westerner guys, the guys with homes and ranches, how do they respond to this type of work? Well, they, they respond well with it. I mean, it's just, it's, there are moments for any photographer or illustrator to capture. And that's my goal, is to create a moment through my illustration style of scratch board. Something yeah. that's memorable. That's, you know, I mean, <clears throat> the, the goal is that people collect art that they like. And what moves them, you know, in my case, what moves me is really becoming part and illustrating the animal kingdom. There's right. nothing more majestic. Um, Mo and it's just moments and it's gone you know whether it's a domestic a, a do people have a relationship with their pets and that just continues to grow because they can look at them and they know what they're thinking and the animal knows what they're thinking and all of a sudden there's a relationship <clears throat> so you see that in just our domestic there's the free range which i do here and then there's the endangered species which so let's talk about that you were sharing with me that this particular course is, you know, there are a lot of them in Chicago. How's that possible? What's, how does that happen? The course? No, you said that, you said that they have a lot of horses in Chicago. Oh, okay, yes. Well, okay, good. So back to the Mustangs. Thanks, thanks, for, um, thanks for bringing me back to that. And so the 50% <clears throat> of the Mustangs in the United States are in pens in Illinois because the government decided that they were going to re-engineer the herds. So through, what, does, what does that mean, re-engineer? Well, take them and disperse them. They, they deplete them by giving and rounding them up. In, 19, in 1972, Richard Nixon, the president at that time, banned helicopter roundups. Meanwhile, it's occurring today. So it's, it's you know, call it what you will, the government's involved with the managing of free-range animals. What is, what is the threat? I mean, why, why, are they, why does the government do that? Well, uh, you know, there's many reasons. It's called the, BM, uh, the Bureau of Land Management. So there's the good and the bad. <clears throat> so way longer conversation. The best thing to do is to go to the website at BLM and understand. In some cases, um, the, uh, the Mustangs are in places that the 
uh, food source is not sustainable um, because of, you know, it's a year of a drought. And then, then next year the rains come. And right. so what, they, what they're doing is trying to manage all that process, like trying to manage global warming. Why are they taking to Chicago? That's what they chose. What do, what do they, do they, do they slaughter them there? What do they do? Well, I mean, there's a lot of them that get slaughtered. I mean, um, some of them, they round them up and send them to Mexico for meat. Right. There's, slaughter, there's slaughterhouses here in the West, et cetera. You know, this, this whole conversation is <clears throat> it's a tough one for me because, you know, my, my role or I see my role is the going in and representing nature. So I'll go into a ranch and I'll talk to ranchers um, uh, and, you know, I develop a rapport with the animal. Uh, sometimes they're way too skittish. Other times, the first Mustang I did was Red Rider. Um, and he is written up. He's the most... You know, this, this Red Rider? Actually, no, that's Picasso. That's the most photographed Mustang in the United States. He okay. lives the free range Mustang yeah. in the Sand Wash Basin, which is up north of northwest. It's in the northwest corner of Colorado. It's north of Dinosaur, Colorado. So there's about 400 in this herd. This is Picasso. And then what's unique about him is he's free range, but look at how beautiful the color is. Yeah. In that pattern. And now his offsprings are bearing his markings. Oh, okay. Now, John Wagner is the photographer. And I've done um, two different illustrations of Picasso. And he, he's the most prolific promoter of the free range of the sand wash basin. And has posts, he'll send me posts every day on social media, Facebook particularly. If you go to John Wagner, you'll find his posts. Um, so there's, there's people that are passionate about nature and I have a tendency to want to follow them and listen to the story and then represent them in Scratch Board. Now, you know, could you give us some information or idea about your philanthropic charitable work with respect to these issues? Sure. There's, on my website, there's five different charities. Um, I chose them and I give 10% back to the charity, depending upon which show I'm going into, or people request, gee, I, here's my five charities. Where, where would you like part of the fee that I collect back to which charity you would, you would like? So, I, you know, I, as, as an artist, between all the shows I do, some of the commissions, getting known, selling, uh, manufacturing the books, and what it takes to be an artist and to be um, more of a philanthropic attitude, it takes something to do that. So, what do you mean by that? Can, can you well, probably, you know, I, well, it has to come from within. Yes. So, so more than a year ago, I decided, you know what, I'm going to live the life that I want. If not now, when? So I decided to just become involved and then to state it on my website, specific charities. And then I've got a story behind every one of them. On three of the charities, three out of the five, there's a short video that explains the charity. <clears throat> On Friends of Western Art, it doesn't have a video, but it will soon. The Mustang Foundation of America does not have a video, and that is supporting free-range Mustangs. And I donate to that, and it's really about um, supplying them food during the tougher times, depending upon the season. So, in other words, let's say there's a hard winter; they don't they don't have anything to eat. Somebody goes over there and drops some some hay or whatever they give them. Is that right? Alfalfa, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's it's simply because I do mustangs. I really enjoy doing mustangs because it's a free spirit. 
you know, there were many, many people talk about um, when, when were horses here? And they, you know, pretty much it's known that the Spaniards brought the horses, but they found petroglyphs and they found uh, that are, they are dated back years and years and, and centuries before the Spaniards got here with horses. Absolutely. Yeah, they, they find um, sites where they've got decomposed bones, et cetera. So the, we don't know. You know, every year they have a new discovery. Whatever. Yes, that's true. It's so the basic thing. Where they found this. Oh my God, we got a mammoth here. How yeah. do we get a mammoth? Right. You know, in, in in Arizona or whatever it may be. You know, the the structure of the Earth is just so complicated and so old that you know, with research, we're finding more and more, and we get continually get educated and educated. You can get lost in education. You can. So, the reason I, I did it is because it's just what I did, and I decided to do it. So and I'm, 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 I'm happy. And I donate and I follow causes. And I'm happy you do. Congratulations. Thank you. I went, oh, what about this wonderful piece here? Well, it's wolves. Um, some people are ma passionate about wolves. <clears throat> um, you know, the, the criteria on uh, breeding dogs with wolves is interesting. In Arizona, you can only have um a wolf as a pet as long as it has 50 percent dog in it why is that I, because the government's decided that that's why somebody passed a law and that's what it is but i know people that have wolves for pets and they're they're amazing they're the digestive system is the same there's not a lot of difference so it's now going back and get educated what's the difference between a wolf and a dog spelling <laughs> okay. And, and I'm sure, you know what, I'm not, I can't, I can't address the DNA. I'm not a scientist. Um, but there are many, many dogs that sure look like wolves. Yeah. I mean, the species evolved over time. So, I, yeah, I've done about five different wolves. Some have been requests. Um, some people are passionate about wolves. I mean, I, the German people, I've had uh, three different sales um, where people visiting this country here come over to go to the Grand Canyon. Then they, they, they meet me at different shows, et cetera. And they love wolves and will tell you appropriately. They just, it's, a it's a magnificent animal. Right. So... Different, cult different cultures have, of course, you know, ter term favorite animal, favored animals. I would say. Well, speaking of that, let's let's go look at these. These guys are from Australia, right? <laughs> Australian blue healers. They're amazing dogs. Now these are these are what in Arizona we call race dogs. <clears throat> They're extremely loyal. A very very high energy. You cannot put these dogs in an apartment. You'll you'll they they develop emotional problems. Okay. You want to run. They're outstanding catalogs. They round up. Um, they're extremely very very bright, high intelligence. So um, there's border collies that are um, you know round up sheep or cows or whatever have you. But Australia, and these guys are, they're neat looking. They're just a high energy dog. And what do they do? They round up sheep or what? Sheep, they'll round up people. <laughs> really? Yeah, if you've got a family, you know, I know people with families and, you know, mom goes out to the car and they'll round up the kids. Really? <laughs> yes, I know people with these and I actually know, um, I know the people that the, the owners of this, and he has a massive amount of property on the Mexican Arizona border. And these are his two dogs. How big are they? They look like they're kind of small. They are. They're small. They might be. You know, it depends upon um, male, female, um, whatever have you. They might be thirty pounds, thirty-five pounds. Right. Right. You know, right. Twenty pounds. But I, I can see the intelligence in their eyes. Ooh. Isn't that something? See, now that you just brought up a, a good point, you see something in their eyes. 
And that's the point. When I do illustrations, you'll see something and it'll mean something to you. Yes. So it's individual, whether it's a horse or a dog or a mule or, any, you know, or a bison. There's something about the stance. There's something about the eyes. Yep. And, if, and, if you can, and if an illustrator can capture that moment, then you identify. That's something, and that's why people become collectors. Because uh, there's something to it. Well, I, I, I see. I mean, you were successful here. The Thank buff, you. The buffalo as well. I mean, this, this is your piece de resistance, the big one. Yeah. Can we expect to see? Can we expect to see any more? Or when are you going to do another piece like this on this magnitude, this type of effect? I have on my table uh, several. Oh, I just finished a lioness, which is magnificent. Okay. I uh, I have a Alaskan brown bear, sow, and cub looking right at you in the woods. Whoa. The oh. And the big one, um, the big one is 36 by 24. And <clears throat> it's Alaskan moose. Ah, okay. It was infamous. <laughs> and the name of Hook. And um, he, it's going to take months and months to do. Um, I, I work at my studio, obviously, but then I also work live during the show. So I'll bring whatever I'm working on for people to see, and I can explain the art of scratch board. That's marvelous. So let's sort of, we did that when we, we did your, your book, and this is your Wildlife Conservancy, Conser Conservation Society uh, logo. Yes. This is one of the charities that you support. It is. You know, it was established back in the um, late 1800s. It's the largest uh, society uh, for conservation. It supports 60 different nations. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it might be uh, the bison, which is endangered. Um, the bison is endangered? Why is, I thought, I thought they, we got the bison back on, back on the chart. No. No. What about all the, what about, what about all the, what about all those buffalo farms I keep hearing about, the ranches? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's still, you know, there were, there were millions and millions. And they brought it back from extinction. <clears throat> and, and there are also, um, some of them have disease. Oh, well, that's... I mean, it's a, it's a whole other... You know, how many bison are there? Um, under 50,000. Oh, from millions and millions. Right, right. But, well, you know. It, it, but the Wildlife Cons uh, Conservation Society supports amphibious animals. Okay. Lowland gorillas, lions, elephants. So, so it's, it's the largest organization that I know of. You know, what well, interests me about this one, and what I do is I go in, back into the analytics of the organization. 82% of the funds they collect go to the 60 countries and the causes directly. That's good. That's very good. 14% go to the promotion and securing the marketing for securing more funds. 2% hmm. is to support the salaries of the people. So they take two cents out of every dollar donated just to take the organization and move it forward. That's commendable. Yeah. Where are you going to find a large, the largest organization in, in the world of this type that only takes 2%? Now, now Paul, so some of the organizations that I, I support give 100%. Really? Well, American Mighty Warriors. Um, started by Debbie Lee. Her son was the first Navy SEAL, the first SEAL shot in Afghanistan. Okay. So she's met with President Bush twice. And what she is about 
and I contribute, and I've got notes back from Debbie. Uh, she lives, uh, it, she's funded, uh, founded here in Surprise, Arizona, American okay. Mighty Warriors. Oh. And it's for all about the families. So, a military man passes. What about the family? What about the wife? What about the kids? What about yeah. the mom? Right. That's, so, that's a hard life. To 100% goes back. All right. So, so it's, you know, I mean, it's military. So, you know, there are a number of military organizations asking for funding. Great. Yes. Go to the analytics and find out truly how much goes to the veterans and their, and their subsequent causes or their needs. So, you know, I've go, so I've, I've queried all of these and I give them far more than just the five. I support Boys and Girls Club. Um, that's, that's, that's American I, Cancer Society. I mean, I, as an artist, artists get solicited on a weekly basis for a charity, especially toward the end of the year. Okay. And I give, and I give to many more people, just like a lot of other artists do. It's just part of who we are. You know, we're visual, we're self-expressed. Uh, we all do this not only for our self-enjoyment, but to make a difference. Well, and I'll say that you is, made, you're, you're called, making a difference now in the sense that looking at your images, it makes me be thankful for what you do because I live in a urban area, it's concrete jungle. When I see your images, I feel like I'm back in nature and it makes me feel calm and relaxed. Thank you. There we are, ladies and gentlemen. There's the man who made it all possible. Paul Hopman, artist, philanthropist, philosopher, and just overall great guy. Uh, yeah, I really want to thank you for coming on today, Paul, and for those listening and watching. This whole interview with Paul Hopman is brought to you by courtesy of the composition uh, efforts of the Academy of Composition. Uh, go to coready.com, check it out. Talk to Don Victor over there, and he can help you with any artistic snafus you may have. And again, we believe that people buy from people they know, and the best way to tell your story, you're right, is through a candid video interview, so they can know who you are. And so with that being said, let's thank, thank you again, Paul. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, join us next time. And ciao out.